Neversoft Entertainment Incorporated was founded in 1994 by three workers from the interactive division of Malibu Comics, and were hired by Playmates Interactive to develop a video game companion to an upcoming CBS animated show called Skeleton Warriors. Development was shifted from the Genesis to the Saturn, and took long enough that the short-lived show was long cancelled by the time the video game came out. That game, a side-scrolling beat-em-up with pre-rendered sprites, did well enough that Neversoft got drafted into doing a Ghost Rider game for former Dreamcast Files subject, Crystal Dynamics. But the latter had money problems, and the game fell apart. With no projects in the pipeline, Neversoft began developing a demo to shop around, a 3D mech shooter they called Big Guns. Playmates contracted them to craft a PS1 port of Shiny Entertainment's MDK, as discussed on the episode on that game's sequel. And Sony picked up the Big Guns license for production, but the MDK port took longer than expected, and Sony had so many notes about Big Guns, which they had renamed Exodus, that the project ended up cancelled altogether, and Neversoft's staff shrunk to just a handful. On the brink of permanently folding, Neversoft got a meeting with big deal publisher Activision, who were hiring a team to pick up and rework a stalled internal project called Apocalypse a third-person shooter they had already sunk a ton of money into, thanks to a licensing deal with actor Bruce Willis, who is inexplicably making his second appearance as a playable character on a Dreamcast Files episode. They initially planned to make Willis an AI companion, doing facial motion capture and voice recording, but found it too expensive, so they made him the protagonist instead. Neversoft's Big Guns engine fit the structural ideas Activision had for Apocalypse like a glove, and production proceeded swimmingly. It was going so well, in fact, that Activision asked Neversoft if they would be interested in picking up a second internal project they hadn't yet solved, a skateboarding game. Extreme sports was an extremely new genre, that didn't have traditions set in stone yet. But Activision hadn't been impressed by what they'd seen. Neversoft had never made a sports game, but decided to give it a try anyway. Skateboarding game just really wasn't a genre. With a couple one-off exceptions, there were two games that not only defined the genre, but basically were the genre. 720 and Skate or Die. Skate or Die was a series of events a la California games, but 720 had you skating around an open area, doing slides and spins, picking up money, and doing tricks to advance. But as far as my research goes, after 1991's Skate or Die Tour de Thrash came out for the Game Boy, there wasn't a single other skateboarding game released until 1997's Top Skater. Top Skater was a top-line, in-house Sega production, and product leads Kenji Kano and Hisao Oguchi, who we discussed in the episode for their subsequent game, Crazy Taxi, noticed the burgeoning extreme sports movement and wanted to craft a wild, colorful, over-the-top fantasy experience, up to and including making the controller an actual skateboard facsimile for wacky arcade fun. One group we know had wacky arcade fun with Top Skater is the Neversoft team, who spent time playing it at a nearby bowling alley during lunch breaks, studying it and internalizing it as a baseline structural influence for their planned game. One thing I discussed back on the Rippin' Rider snowboarding episode was how many games in the early years of extreme sports titles couldn't conceive of any possible format except straightforward downhill races. For all of Top Skater's colorful detail, it was also a very linear experience, which the Neversoft team consciously decided to go away from. 
The team built their new game out of the existing Apocalypse engine. Inspired by the aforementioned 720, as well as Super Mario 64, they decided instead of a linear race, their skateboarding game would give you a wide open play arena. Tasks to complete within the time frame, finding videotapes, or tracking down every letter of the word skate hidden about the level, plus level specific issues like destroying individual objects, as well as general point thresholds obtained by landing and stringing together enough tricks and ollies, grinds, and stalls before the time expires. The team reached out to famed skateboarder Tony Hawk as a consultant, who was impressed with how attentive they were to skateboarding culture. He played the in-process game on a modded PlayStation to give them feedback, and made copies to lend out to his friends, who also had modded PS1s some of which he hand-selected as playable characters in the game. And since the young skateboarders were also big gamers, this got a lot of excitement buzzing in the industry. And the game, now known as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, dropped for PlayStation the same month the Dreamcast released, September of 1999. Immediately upon firing the game up, the first thing you notice is how responsive it is. It can take some getting used to these specific controls, but once you get the hang of what it's doing, it's remarkably fluid, and you can begin chaining together moves and getting aspirational with your tricks without feeling like it's too unforgiving, punishing you for not knowing its ins and outs. As far as forgiveness in gameplay, one of the smartest and coolest things Neversoft did was make it so if you complete any of the specific tasks asked of you, that task stays completed for all future playthroughs. Instead of ruthlessly asking you to put together a perfect run where you get all of their requirements at once, the game encouraged you to play over and over, familiarizing yourself with each of its charming, quirky levels. Vivid, thoughtfully designed stages set in schools or malls or downtown areas, organized for maximum skating aptitude. You can structure specific runs to focus on getting all the letters, or tracking down all the boxes to break, or grinding on all the tables, and everything feels achievable while remaining a lot of fun. It's such an intelligent strategy to encourage consistent play. And even there, they change it up, so some of the stages will have competitions. It just keeps everything fresh, and makes you want to keep playing. The game's use of licensed music also became an extremely iconic part of the experience here, from well-known bands like Dead Kennedys, Suicidal Tendencies, and Primus, down to more obscure groups like Speed Dealer, Unsane, and Aquasky. Famously, the L.A. ska-punk band Goldfinger contributed a song called Superman that became so strongly associated with the series that a contemporary retrospective documentary about the franchise franchise was called Pretending I'm a Superman. Just as in Crazy Taxi, the music creates a specific tone of driving insouciance, a tone I have attempted to recreate here a cappella style, so my video is not demonetized, ha ha ha. But that tone gives a potent punch to all of your actions, especially as the clock runs down and things get more desperate and intense. On release, the game was met with basically universal acclaim, praising basically every part of the experience. The visuals, the structure, the levels, the deep and addictive gameplay, the excellent physics engine, the propulsive soundtrack. The early response to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was so positive that Activision had Neversoft immediately begin work on a sequel, a game we will get to down the line. So for the non-PlayStation ports, they farmed out development to a few other companies. The Nintendo 64 port went to the company Edge of Reality, who had success the previous year with Monster Truck Madness 64. For the Dreamcast port, Activision was apparently so underwhelmed with the sales for previous Dreamcast Files subject and lunatic nonsense odyssey Blue Stinger, 
that they washed their hands of the Tony Hawk release altogether. It instead was passed on to Crave Entertainment, who had future Call of Duty stewards Treyarch do the development. The Dreamcast port took long enough to complete that Grind Session, a game developed by a different team of ex-Crystal Dynamics employees that is a well-made but bald-faced Tony Hawk wannabe that emulated so many of the trends Tony Hawk established, actually came out a day before the Dreamcast port of Tony Hawk. As a kid, I played Tony Hawk at friends' houses, but Grind Session is the one I actually owned, even as an inferior option. The Dreamcast port of Tony Hawk was very well liked, perfectly recreating the structure and physics of the original release, but with sharper graphics and improved animations. The textures are clearer, the frame rate is smoother, it is as good as Tony Hawk 1 had ever looked, at least up until this decade, when Activision had Vicarious Visions, an old-school company excited to do something that wasn't a Skylanders game, make a pitch-perfect recreation of the original Tony Hawk for contemporary audiences. The graphics were better and modern, but it was praised for maintaining the soul and the feeling of Tony Hawk. Because the first Tony Hawk hit so well for everything structurally on the first damn try. I have played hours and hours of this game, and I was excited for my homework on this project to be hours and hours more, because it not only essentially invented a genre, but did it so well, it felt like it had perfected the skateboarding game. Little did we know it would be eclipsed by its immediate sequel, but that is a story for another day. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater has earned its legacy, and it's a joy for any day, any way. Next time, Yellow Wizard needs food badly. Elf is about to die. I've not seen such bravery. Also next time, we must know the secret word. I've got a word for you. Die.